Hello, everyone. Welcome to the series, Mud Talks, Connecting Air Quality, COVID, and Climate Change with Professor Lilia Hawkins and Shelley Miller, Class of 36. My name is Vanessa Chu, Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations. We thank you for attending today's event, and we hope you and your family are safe and healthy during this time. This talk is being recorded and will be distributed after the event. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, and we will try to get through as many questions as we can. Now, I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers to introduce themselves. Lilia, can you take it away, please? Yes, thank you. And thank you, Vanessa, for putting this together. And I wanna put a special thank you out there to um, Professor Shelley Miller for joining us in this event. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. So um, I'm Lilia Hawkins. I am an associate faculty member in the chemistry department. And I'd like to ask um, Shelly, who is an alumna and a professor of mechanical engineering to introduce herself. Thank you. It's really, uh, this is a fun opportunity. Thank you so much for inviting me back and, and to talk to the alumna and for arranging this. Um, so I'm a professor at University of Colorado Boulder and I'm in the mechanical engineering department. At CU Boulder, we have a lot of environmental engineering, environmental science type of education and research, but I'm in mechanical because all of the air pollution people are in mechanical because mechanical systems generate air pollution. And we want our air pollution engineers to also know how to solve, um, our mechanical engineers know how to solve air pollution. So this semester I'm teaching air pollution control engineering, my favorite class to teach. We design bag house filters and, um, Knox burners. It's really a fun class to teach. I also teach indoor air pollution and environmental engineering fundamentals. Um, so I started out um, winding my way through the path of I like math. I don't know how many people of you have started out that way, but when your high school teacher says, hey, you seem to be doing really good at math, um, and I said, oh, and then the professor, the teacher says, well, why don't you study math in, in, in college? And that was my, okay, why not? So I started to study math in college and that's where I started and now here I am. Um, along the way at the college I was at, there were only two years worth of math. So by the end of the second year of college, I ran out of math classes <laughs> and my faculty and my parents said, you need to go to a different school. And that's how I ended up at Harvey Mudd. So I ended up at Harvey Mudd loving the math program. And I just, it really was such a great experience to live at Harvey Mudd and study with the wonderful students and faculty there. Um, but then I began to meet these people called engineers and I had never heard of an engineer or didn't even know, <laughs> know what an engineer was, honestly. And um, so I was curious, but I didn't worry about it. Um, the reason I became a professor was because I met my only female professor in my whole career at Claremont McKenna. She was teaching uncertainty and failure analysis and she was the coolest professor I'd ever met. And I thought, okay, well, I want to be like that professor. I better just be a professor. <laughs> so that's how I came up with the idea of being a professor. It actually does turn out that I am kind of like her. And I actually don't even remember her name, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so I graduated from Harvey Mudd. I worked as an engineer at TRW. But because I didn't have an engineering degree, they paid me less. And I was kind of <laughs> upset about that. So all of these little things are piling up in my head to make me think, well, what is this engineering thing? And then when I went to graduate school to become, a, uh, to do my research and learn how to be a professor, I, I began to realize that I wanted to actually solve problems using my math skills. And that led me into engineering. And when I found environmental engineering, that just enlightened this passion in me to solve environmental problems using math and physics and chemistry. Mm -hmm. And so that led me then to the, the, the place that I am now, which is to solve air pollution problems with an engineering approach. And uh, it's been a great ride, I have to say, um, but very challenging, lots of failures along the way, as you can hear from my short story right now. So Layla, uh, Lily, I'd love to hear how you ended up at MUD um, and what your story is like. 
Yeah, thank you. That was that was great to hear. I think really helpful for our students to to, to hear about your path and you know uh, it's registration time at Harvey Mudd, so students are kind of stressing about what class am I going to take next semester and will that determine my whole future? So no, students, <laughs> it will not. Um, so I uh, started out through. Uh, environmental science actually ending up towards aerosol science. So I started as an earth uh, environmental systems major, so sort of an earth science major at UC San Diego, and um, really loved all of that uh, broad training in earth sciences. And then uh, as a oh, junior, I took an atmospheric chemistry course from Kim Prather, and um, who's well known in our community for, for her work. And it just like I had that moment, like you said, it opened up my eyes and I thought about science in a new way, chemistry in a new way, and um, using the things I love doing, math, science, physics, to work towards solving some environmental problems. And so uh, upon advisement of her, I added a second major, which was chemistry, because it turned out that all the classes I needed to be prepared to study um, atmospheric chemistry in graduate school, uh, for, through her eyes at least, were, were all the chemistry classes I hadn't yet taken. So with a double major in environmental science and chemistry, I ended up at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in their climate sciences program with more broad training, it's a theme for me, broad training across uh, climate science and then focusing my research in aerosol chemistry. And I did a short postdoc teaching and doing research with David DeHaan at the University of San Diego, which is my first taste of the undergraduate environment. So that for me coming from UC San Diego for 10 years, I guess, for undergraduate and graduate school, um, to see what it was like to mentor undergraduates full time, to teach them in the classroom, but then also in the research setting to design projects that were accessible to students and, and yet still the same type of research that my colleagues at R1 institutions are doing was really um, the, the point where I knew this is what I wanted to do. And actually, it wasn't long after I started my postdoc that Harvey Mudd opened the position that I applied for. And so here I am. And after 10 years here, I can't believe it, but it's been wonderful. Um, so I, I've really been fortunate to, to follow that path that ended at Harvey Mudd. Um, and I wanted to say to everyone, and to you in particular, um, Shelley, that I think it's kind of funny how we connected. So um, I didn't know of your work because, because I'm in like the chemistry world and, and you're in the air pollution control world, even though we're both doing aerosol science, I didn't know we had um, that, you, that, you know, that you were an alum. And I saw you speaking at AAAR in 2019 as a plenary speaker. And you were fabulous. Everyone said you were going to be. And so I went to the talk very early in the morning at AAAR. And I thought, oh, I've got to bring her to Mud. I wonder if she knows about Harvey Mudd. And then come to find out when I looked you up, you went to Harvey Mudd. And I just thought that's got to be a sign. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm super excited to, to have you here and to get to um, ask you some questions and hear about your work in more detail and to have our community, um, our students especially, to, to hear from you. And so on that note, I, I want to ask you first about this explosion of aerosol related work in the last year as it relates to um, COVID and what that was like for you personally and, and why your ex expertise has been so sought after. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have worked in the area of the specialized area for an urban air pollution person of control of infectious diseases since I finished my PhD at Berkeley. One of my very first projects was, can we use air cleaners to protect against tuberculosis transmission? And that's because in the 2000s, there was a resurgence of drug resistant tuberculosis that started hitting the US and all over the world. I mean, we even had tuberculosis cases in high schools here in Colorado. And we thought, oh goodness, we can't control tuberculosis anymore with prophylactics, like we've been so successful. So can we lean back on engineering? So we started studying air cleaners and germicidal UV lamps were, the, were all the rage before we came up with drug treatments. And so that was my first project and one of the chapters in my dissertation. And so ever since then, 
my very first research funding project was from the CDC to study germicidal UV for tuberculosis. Um, and we started to do work in that area ever since. And so when, um, and plus I'm also an expert in indoor environments. So in an urban, in, in an urban setting, we have outdoor air pollution and indoor air pollution. And air pollution problems are so broad that I've really spent most of my time focusing on particulate air pollution. Whereas Lily, I know you're focusing on the more of the chemical gas phase part, part of air pollution. And uh, so when COVID and all the infections started happening, we had started having a pandemic, I was so afraid like everyone else. How are we getting sick? How is transmission happening? That's the first question we were all asking. And you know, the CDC and the WHO and everyone was saying it's surface transmission. And so everyone was washing their groceries and I'm you know, madly washing my hands. But then as we beca I began to talk to colleagues and begin to watch the outbreaks unfold. It was so obvious to us that it was actually had nothing to do with surfaces. It was all airborne, just like tuberculosis and measles. And so starting in April, um, a group of 36 of us international scientists got together to start trying to remind the WHO that airborne transmission is a thing and they should tell the world that it's airborne. And they just thought we were crazy. And they have been um, ignoring airborne trans transmission ever since. Uh, the CDC also has been, had been, under the previous administration, ignoring um, airborne transmission as much as they could possibly do. So it was left to us grassroots, very few experts in infection control from an engineering perspective to help tell people how to be safe. And sort of that's what I that's what I undertook as my like service mission to the world. Like, how do you keep yourself safe? Crazy, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a lot. Yeah. When did you first realize it was aerosol transmission, Lilia? Uh, I've been following uh, Kim Prather's, you know, social media <laughs> blitz on this, and so I think her timing was similar to yours as uh, early and often advocating for the, the aerosol transmission route. And it makes a lot of sense. But I too was wiping down surfaces and hand washing and, um, you know, so yeah. probably about the same timing. You know? Yeah. So there was a, a big impact uh, on my work at MUD too, um, but v in a very different way to yours. So, um, so there were, changes in LA, noticeable changes to the air quality. As a result of the lockdown um, late March and early April, we also had very rainy weather. So we had, you know, doubly clear skies. And it was my first time being asked to speak publicly, like to the media. So I did a few interviews, which was um, exciting, a little scary too, at the same time being new to that. And, uh, and we've been studying that too. So I was able to keep um, one of my instruments running uh, in a remote fashion, more or less, a mass spectrometer, and, and manage it from home without having to go into lab too much. And so now we have this data set. Of course, many other people have data sets about air quality during COVID, um, and there are publications coming out about that, trying to learn, you know, with changes in sources, what does the outdoor air pollution look like? How, how different is that? And, um, and so, uh, and actually on top of that, I've had students do an experiment this year looking at that data in instrumental lab because we're also running in a remote fashion. So it's created new opportunities for teaching, for talking to students about the sources of air pollution. And, um, you know, it was certainly a negative impact on having students in lab to do research, but I think, um, much yeah, I, I, uh, I think what's interesting about your work right now is that, um, is that air pollution in, in the Los Angeles area and the history of it is so fascinating. And I don't think, I do teach about that, which I'm sure you do too, but you know, nobody really knew that air pollution was a thing until the 1950s. And my father was attending medical school in Glendale around that time and even before that time and he would say in the summer when it was hot they would open the windows because it was hot and all the air pollution would come in and some days it would be so bad it was actually kind of hard to see the chalkboard <laughs> 
And I realized that I grew up in high in the Southern California going to high school in Harvey Ma during the days when you had to go home from school for air pollution, ozone level violations. And I went home a lot. You know, they just sent us home a lot because of ozone um, violations. And, but it's so fascinating because over the decades, the area has grown bigger and bigger and more and more cars. And yet because of engineering, <laughs> we've really solved a lot of the air pollution issues in the region. And I, and I just always think that's fascinating. And now this experiment using your um, instrument was able to show even a bigger impact, right? Yeah, and it's really fascinating and it's gonna, it's going to help us answer some of the big questions about the future um, as we move to more electric cars, fewer fossil fuel powered cars, fewer fossil fuel powered anything, hopefully, um, that we will see changes, um, perhaps nonlinear changes to our air quality. So I think it's really interesting. And I wanted to ask you, you know, what is next for you in terms of open research questions? As, has it COVID informed any of that? Or, you know, were you already going in a certain direction and you're going to continue? Mm, that's a great question. COVID has allowed me to do a, a few um, extra projects that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. And I found them fascinating, still in the area of infectious disease control and prevention. Uh, one of the one of the projects I got in, got interested in um, was when a couple of musicians called me and said to me, "Do you want to help save music?" And I I thought, well, I like so saving all sorts of things. Yes, I'll I'll figure out how to help you with saving music. And so they brought together uh, hundreds of small and large music, musical organizations to donate money to fund our research lab for about nine months to do a study of do aerosols come through instruments when they're playing when they're being played and will that be a risk for COVID transmission? Because one of the first outbreaks that we investigated as, a, as an international scientific team was the Skagit Valley Coral outbreak, where 87% of the singers got sick in two hours and, and two to three, pe three people died. And after that, so this project was really, really exciting to be able to work on a really applied problem and tell musicians before fall, okay, well, here's what we think will, will really reduce your risk of COVID transmission and you can keep playing. And anecdotally, we haven't seen any outbreaks for any programs that have used our mitigation measures. Um, but I've always wanted to, and I have been working along the lines of how do we solve urban air pollution problems, especially for our communities who are, who are the, at the most vulnerable and we have a lot of um, communities in Denver that live in areas that are heavily impacted by industrial pollution. And so trying to understand that industrial pollution, what, how it impacts their lives and then what to do about it is what I'm still working on to this day. Um, and so that's where I will still, tend, I will still focus my, my main efforts. And what are you thinking of doing next for your projects with your students? I saw you were doing something interesting in France and I was um, gonna ask you about that as well. Yeah, so my research with students at Harvey Mudd takes two flavors. One is Los Angeles air quality and, and measurements directly through the inlet and the lab with the, the equipment that I have. But the other is um, targeted simulations of reactions that might occur, for example, in clouds. Um, with uh, precursors that might be emitted from large wildfires, for example, and to look at um, the way that the transformations might take place to create brown products. So we think a lot about aerosol climate interactions and um, that's, and, and so part of that research involves a cloud chamber in Paris, oh. uh, France that I've taken students to a number of times. We were of course supposed to go in 2020. We're supposed to go this summer too. Um, last summer it didn't happen. The summer is still a big question mark, but um, yeah, that's a, a fun and very different uh, a pr well, we use the same equipment, but we're, we're asking different questions uh, of the, the cloud chamber. So I think for me, I, 
I have a greater appreciation for how rapidly air quality can change when there's a, you know, a lockdown, but also you could think of major shifts in emission sources. So something that has been on my mind and is sort of circulating in my community is what will LA air quality look like in five or 10 years if we do have, as projected, more um, rapid shifts in the types of energy we're using. And how is that going to play out? Is that going to help us with the ozone problem? Because we seem to be stagnating, <laughs> no pun intended, um, with the ozone problem. We're not getting better. And so what, what will that look like? And then for me, the main research training I have is actually aerosol climate interactions. And so Broadly speaking, if we reduce aerosol concentrations, what's that going to do for aerosol climate interactions, aerosol cloud interactions? Um, so I have a lot of open questions about that. And you know, are we targeting aerosol particles that help cool our planet? Um, or are we targeting absorbers, soot, and that kind of, um, those components? And, and how does that change the balance? Um, what, you know, what's the role of aerosol particles in the future on our climate. So I'm thinking a lot about that, as well as the same question that you, you pointed out, um, improving spatial scale for air quality measurements. Uh, low cost sensors are a lot of fun to think about right now, spatial like networks of low cost sensors, for example. So we have the data um, at the neighborhood scale to advocate for policies that will be effective for, for folks, because we don't breathe average air. We breathe our neighborhood's air. Um, and, and actually that connects to something that I wanted to ask you about in terms of your work with the public. So I saw on your, I guess it's a blog or on your, on your research page uh, that you have a lot of information for the public about um, ventilation rates, maybe for, for classrooms, but also air cleaners you talked about. And then this really nice article on the myths of airborne transmission, um, which connects to a question that I saw uh, maybe it was answered in the in the Q and A, um, and that takes a lot of your time. So, how how do you manage that, and and you know why is that important to you? Yes, it's been difficult to manage this year, uh, I must say. And uh, but about halfway through the pandemic, when I started just becoming inundated by um, by individuals needing real help because they weren't finding it, and then the press wanting to talk to me and I just, I mean, I have a family. I, I like to exercise. I, <laughs> I want to go on a hike. I need to eat. I need to sleep. Like it's crazy. And so I, I, it hit me when um, a, a woman sent me a question and I sent her a, a response, but my response was pretty short because I had like a, three seconds to write her. And she wrote me back with this barrage of meanness, like how could you dare answer me like that? That is so rude. And I thought, oh goodness, she has no idea what I'm handling and why I did that. So I decided to write, um, and some of you maybe if you've emailed you, which I actually turned off today, Lilia, I have this automatic response to emails that come to me that say, I'm really sorry if my response is inadequate or I don't even get back to you, but I'm trying to balance, you know, my life, my health, my sleep, my, you know, and my op, my service to the world um, to help with this. And I just, I would appreciate some empathy, right? And, but here's all these resources you can, you can get and maybe you'll find what you need. Um, I did just turn it off today because I decided things had slowed down and I was just over it. I'm not doing, I'm not, <laughs> I'm really not answering that many emails on this topic anymore. I've said enough. Like, I'm just going to repeat myself over and over again. It's tiring. Um, but I'd like to turn my attention to the other things I really have been advocating for for a very long time, which is trying to reduce our use of toxic environmental chemicals and limiting our exposure to cooking emissions in our house and traffic related air pollution. You know, these are real issues that really affect people's health and people have no idea. They think that they think that everything in their house is safe. Every personal care, well, I, some people, you know, don't question the personal care products that they buy at the store, the cleaning products. They think, I've asked people and they think, 
oh, it's for sale, it must be safe. Somebody's regulating it and nobody's regulating it. There's so many toxic chemicals in many of the products we use in our homes. And then a lot of people don't use their cooking hood because it's loud. And there's so much research on the health effects of cooking. So those are the things that I'm now advocating for. And now that people are actually paying attention to indoor air quality and ventilation and air cleaning, which all help, these other problems. I'm just looking forward to those conversations. Yeah, so what kinds of indoor air questions do you get? Do you get any indoor air questions or what kinds of questions do you get? I do, I sometimes get, um, it's usually from members of the community. So either um, students or other faculty or um, alums who've met me who will ask about um, like household filters, additional filters. Um, so now I'm really happy that you have a great resource on your page that I can send people to since you've done all that, that work. And, and you know, it's a case by case basis where I try to think about what the needs of the person are, how large their space might be and explain some of the reasoning without picking a product because it's very hard to pick a product for someone else, but how I would think about it. And the, um, those kinds of questions usually are coming up when there's fires and we're getting smoke. So um, I guess it was, was it last September uh, 2020, and time doesn't mean anything anymore, I think it was September 2020 when the, we had a lot of smoke in the, in the LA area, and uh, California was on fire, I guess, the whole state, but, but we had a lot of smoke, and, and colleagues were asking me about purple air, so not indoor air quality, but, but about these low-cost sensors, and can I go for a run, and um, I had a number of people reach out, so definitely um, that's something that comes up. And I think it should come up more often. People think about outdoor air pollution, but uh, indoor and yeah, we have battles in our house about <laughs> whether incense is okay um, or not. And, and I'm, I'm, an, I'm against it. <laughs> Hi, sorry to interrupt, but I do have a question for Shelly. Um, how do you talk to members of the public about toxic chemicals in everyday products in a way that engages people in a positive way and in a way that's taken seriously? That's such a great question. So the way I do it is from a, a mentor of mine who I find to be one of the most wonderful chemists in, um, in the environmental chemical arena. Um, Arlene Blum is, an, is one of the first women chemist to graduate from, you know, from MIT. And now she's also the first woman to have climbed Annapurna. And now she runs this Green Science Policy Institute. So I'm pointing people to her framing of environmental toxic chemicals because it's, come, it's so overwhelming. Thousands of chemicals. Uh, when we work on one chemical, then we finally prove it's toxic, like BPA, and then it gets banned. And then the chemical manufacturers just take that molecule, take one little piece of it off, add a slightly different, maybe not a sulfur, we'll add a fluorine. And then it's basically the same chemical, but now we have no data to show it's toxic. So then we repeat the whole cycle of showing it's toxic. And so it's just this endless problem of whack-a-mole, right? So she frames it in the way of thinking about it as six classes of toxic chemicals. And we wanna ban the class. And you wanna do what you can to limit your exposure to that class. So for example, when she came to talk at CU Boulder, she started talking about flame retardants. And I had really never heard of this problem, but uh, it originated when the state of California required, well, flame retardants are required in all sorts of products, but it got into our homes when the state of California started requiring it to be used on um, cushioned uh, furniture. Since, since that time in the 2000s, finally Governor Brown was able to get the legislation changed and now you can buy sofas without flame retardants. But we just, for example, bought a new tent and my husband said to me, serendipitously, this tent has no flame retardants in it, Shelly. I, it's the only tent for sale at REI that doesn't have flame retardants in it. Aren't we lucky? And I'm just like so excited because all other tents have flame retardants in it. And you don't know because the label doesn't tell you. Anyway, I recommend people going to the Green Science Policy Institute 
learning about the six classes of toxic chemicals and make a pledge to yourself to do one thing different in each class in your life. While the rest, while the science policy people try to get better laws and better regulations to limit the class use. Thank you, Shelley. You're welcome. I give a lecture, I give like literally one week to one lecture on this topic every year and it's always my students' most favorite conversation. And it, you know, it's something I didn't know about either. So um, thank you for asking that question, Ivy, because I think that's a student of Lilia's, right? Yes, yes, Ivy is my newest research student on my team. And I wonder if maybe the next time you give that lecture, you could record it because I bet that lots of people would benefit from, from hearing that. And actually that answers one of the questions I had was, what do you do differently or do you do anything differently in your daily life as a direct result of, of what you've learned through your work? And one thing that I do differently is every time I turn on my stove, even if it's not going to be something smoky, I turn on the exhaust fan. And that is a direct result of you and talking about just how much NOx and, and everything else, even when you don't realize it, is coming into your home and how, what a difference that makes. So I think, uh, and it, it's, of course, obvious when someone points it out to you. But I think that's, that's really um, something that I value. And I'm glad that you shared that. And I, I love these daily tips. I think it's really helpful. Yeah, thank you. I know I do too. Um, and I, I, I learn them all the time myself. So it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's very important that we keep talking about these things and sharing them. And I was just going to say to people that I uh, was trying to convince Lilia to join Twitter the other day when I talked to her, because it's a, a very um, useful way to communicate to others, including the public. Um, just some important stuff like this. Like all of a sudden, if I learn about this flame retardant, non-flame retardant tent, I might tell people to go buy it. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, so I was, that's kind of one thing that I have stuck to over the years is, is that's the only social media I really do for science. And I, and I strictly try to help people um, understand the science through that kind of communication. But I learn a lot on it myself. For sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've, um, yeah, so so before we get too much into the, the questions, there is something I want to ask you, which is how your, your time at Harvey Mudd prepared you for where you are now, and if you would have done anything differently um, while at Mudd, knowing where you would end up. Great question. I think that what I what I loved about Harvey Mudd was the experience of the five colleges and it started to broaden my horizons, which is what I needed. And it introduced me to engineers. And um, it also got me started on this path of research and wanting to go to graduate school because my math professor, Professor Borelli, uh, would, uh, wrote my wrote my recommendation letter to get into Berkeley. And I am sure, because he came from Berkeley, and I'm sure the only way I got into Berkeley was because of his letter. Because I have to say, I did go back and look at my GPA. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I got into Berkeley with a 3.3? That's pretty amazing. <laughs> Not anymore, I'm sure. Um, so I wish, actually, though, and I hope that this has changed for young women today, but I wish I had heard about what engineering was, science, technology, you no know, STEM. I wish I had heard about it. I grew up in a community where most people turned out to be uh, medical professionals. And, I know, and so I wish I had known about engineering and I wish I had studied engineering at Harvey Mudd. I mean, I, I love my math, and, but it turned out for me who I am and what I wanted to do that an engineering path would have really been super valuable for me to do because then when I got to Berkeley I had to take fluid mechanics and I had to I had to start speaking like an engineer and it was so hard it, it took me at least a, two semesters to figure out how to change from a math person to an engineer and how to think like an like there's a real thing it's really think like an engineer so so those are a couple of things that I learned along the way. Um, 
and, and that I wish that I had had different opportunities, but you know, yeah. yeah. So we have a pretty active uh, society for women engineers and it's, it's not limited to our engineering majors or engineering students by any means. And they do outreach events. I participated in where, uh, with high school students, um, women, high school students who come to campus and, and, uh, you know, we do small um, activities with them in different disciplines. So we do have a lot of that going on. And I think, you know, on the same point for students who are, who are at Harvey Mudd right now, or for our community members who might wonder what our students are doing, I would just point to our core as a place where students take courses across a range of disciplines. I mean, both of us have had to cross these disciplinary boundaries to answer the questions that we want to answer and to feel comfortable taking classes outside your major, which our students do very frequently, um, even without any requirements. And also equally important is that our students are taking so many uh, humanities, social sciences and arts classes in parallel with their technical training um, and then concentrating, they do a concentration as well. So they, they develop this agility or ability to move across fields that I think for environmental work, um, especially this kind of environmental work is really helpful. It makes them valuable um, innovators. And I think that, um, that that's something special about the Harvey Mudd education to, to allow students to move. And even, you know, you, t you moved, right, from math to engineering. So for an engineering PhD from a, a math background, and certainly that, you know, math is very helpful, important, critical to what you do. Um, but a lot of people don't think about being able to move outside the, their path or their silo. So I think that's, that's really wonderful. Yeah, I have to say, I still remember my What is Science class from Harvey Mudd. I still think about that class a lot. Um, and I also have to say how encouraging it has been to me to watch the evolution at Harvey Mudd College change from a, a school where there was 10% women when I went to now, you know, over 50% women and the, the president is a woman and it's just, um, and the diversity has increased and it's, and it's, it's so, um, it's, I'm so proud and it's, uh, you know, it can be done. You know, meanwhile, I have been disappointed and discouraged at CU Boulder, where in mechanical engineering, we still hover like 15% women in our department. We, we, we don't do enough to try to sort that out. Yeah, and it's so important to have um, a diversity of backgrounds, experiences, perspectives when you're trying to solve something like uh, air pollution or work on climate, right? And, and I noticed in, um, well, in the paper on the choir, I think in particular, there was this team of scientists and, and engineers uh, working on this problem and epidemiologists and, and what have you. And I, I wanted to say that when, we, when the virus, uh, transmission, when the aerosol route of transmission became obvious, I did feel a little bit, a little bit proud of myself for knowing so much about aerosols and, and like being able to explain to people why masks were effective, even if they weren't N95 masks, that they could still be helpful under what situations you would need a mask, why the six foot rule was kind of, and you know, what, where was it safe to go? I felt like I had this um, secret knowledge of, of this transmission. I could see something other people couldn't, although I had zero knowledge about viruses, very, very little biology background. And so your team was obviously very interdisciplinary as you were working on this. And I wanted to, to ask what it's like to work with such a, a diverse team in terms of disciplines on a problem. Yeah, that is one thing that I have really loved in my career is being able to work on an interdisciplinary collaborative in a dis interesting collaborative way. The the team of the team that we've continued to work together even to this day, we have another paper coming out on trying to shift the paradigm of how we think about airborne infections or and you know compared to um, so that's a really interesting paper. But what I love about it is that yes. Lilia and I have a secret power because we understand aerosol and it's complicated. I mean, aerosol and measurement and physics is complicated. And, but this team of 
public health professionals and hospital infectious disease docs. And a, one of my co-authors is, is an expert on surface disinfection. And another colleague is an atmospheric chemist. And, but we all really take serious aerosol transmission and airborne transmission. And to me that validated my, my belief and my work because if it was just aerosol scientists who were, you know, yammering on about airborne transmission, it would have, I would have, you know, had a little bit of second guessing of myself thinking, am I crazy? But so, you know, so many of my colleagues who have nothing to do with aerosols um, or aerosol science also see the aerosol transmission and are trying to educate. And, and so, that's been really, really rewarding to work across disciplines and all working on the same, um, same motivation that we need to help people understand aerosol transmission so they can keep themselves safe. And there's a, a question in the chat that maybe um, relates to what you just said. I don't know if you wanna um, sure. answer it. Do you want me to read it out? Yeah, so there's a question about CO2. There's a lot of talk about CO COVID and indoor air quality and how do we understand indoor air quality by just looking at CO2 and is that good enough? Should we be looking at particulate matter? And then how do we understand whether environment can be vulnerable to airborne viruses? Um, so for it's, it's a tough question, but really right now, looking at airborne particle levels isn't that helpful for us in terms of airborne disease transmission because the amount of virus in your airborne, in your air is compared to the rest of the particles in your air is so small that you're ne never going to be able to find them. It's like a needle in a haystack. It's very difficult to do air sampling for uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, if you take a cubic centimeter of typical urban air, there's 10,000 particles in that cubic centimeter, right? And how many of them are virus? Most of the time, none, right? And so the reason that we've been advocating for measuring CO2 is because we're trying to think of a way to help people understand what is, um, wh what is coming from your respiratory tract. And every time you exhale, you exhale CO2. So every time you, I exhale CO2, I might exhale virus. And then you'll inhale my CO2 and you might inhale my virus. So that's why we're trying to track CO2. Now CO2 in a, in a building is complicated plus there's CO2 outside. And what controls the CO2 um, relationship is your ventilation. And so we have found that outbreaks only happen in poorly ventilated spaces or non-ventilated spaces with a lot of people. And then the, the probability of a, a high virus shitter goes way up and you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so that's why we're trying to help people understand what's your ventilation, how do you, improve it. And, and that's been where most of my effort has been. So I hope that helps with that question. Yeah, that and was great. And there's another Lilia, one. Lilia, what do you think about this question? You know, that one is coming to you. <laughs> yeah, and that's uh, one of my former research students, actually, um, who, I don't know if you saw in her note, but she's going to start working at the Green Policy Science Institute. Um, oh my was, goodness! The person you mentioned, yes, oh, Green, Science, Green Science Policy Institute with Arlene Blum in that's June. Awesome. So that's a kind of fun little circle. Um, so I think it's going to be hard to stop wearing masks. I mean, I'm so used to it in crowded spaces, and I think you know, for keeping common cold transmission down, um, for keeping things like flu at lower numbers. I I don't know. Um, you know, there are places in the world where people wear masks when they're sick. Um, and then, of course, during heavy air pollution events, right? So um, in Asian countries, that's very, very common. And I, I don't think it's a bad practice. I think it was something that was very um, foreign to Americans to be wearing masks like that in public, but now it's not. And so I, I'm a fan of targeted approaches. I think 
if you can accept what the scientists are saying, and this applies to climate as well as air pollution, right? If you can accept what the scientists are saying, then you can be smart about what you want to do about it. You don't have to be afraid. You can, you can listen to our best evidence and then take those actions and not have to do, do everything, do all the things, although for in climate, we need to, we need to do all of the things. Um, so I don't know, I, I will probably wear a mask myself in crowded or indoor places for a while. Um, I will be, be more comfortable. Yeah, I hear you. I think that's, I like what you said about um, science and scientists, because we've been struggling for a while with the credibility of scientists. And what's driven me crazy is when the bulk of evidence and bulk of scientists say one thing and one or two people say the other and, and still we're questioning the science, that, that makes me crazy. Um, the majority of scientists are out to discover the answer to the best of their ability and, and further, further what we know. And, and so following the bulk of the evidence is, is a really good approach. Um, Dr. Beverly Yates asks about the smoke analogy, and, and we have used um, smoking as a good analogy for trying to visualize aerosol. You can smell cigarette smoke when somebody's driving in a car in front of you, and you can smell it when you're in a space, even if a person is left from the smoking and they're still lingering. So smoking is a good analogy. It's it's also has some disadvantages and there's a lot of gas phase pollution as well. And it's a semi-volatile pollutant, but it gives people the idea of smoking. And a lot of my first research was also on environmental um, secondhand smoke control. I'm glad that you said that because I've been using that analogy and I was yeah, it's a good analogy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hoping that, that you agreed. And it yeah. looks like, um, uh, we have a couple more questions of one about. So, so Eric oh, yeah. is talking about service cleaning. And I think that service cleaning, there's been no evidence in the literature to show anything related to transmission via surface, via surfaces. Um, and so I really try to rely on the scientific literature. I'm like, I haven't seen a paper showing any transmission by surfaces. And I think people, have just are still trying to come up to speed on all of this because of the lack of communication from from CDC and WHO on this until just recently the CDCA with Rochelle Rolinsky has done a great job. In fact, I just found a paper with her as an author, author today on CO2 and shared air and I was really, really excited to find that paper. No wonder she's advocating for, you know, improved, improved um, understanding of aerosol respiratory diseases and ventilation. But I do see someone's asking about the ventilation in your home. So I have a blog about the um, home ventilation and the home ventilation is actually non-existent. Uh, you only have usually a furnace that recycles your indoor air to heat it or cool it. And most homes are very, very tight and they're great places for outbreaks for COVID. Uh, because most people, most people don't have ventilation. So if you want to read more about household ventilation, you can go there. I do recommend running your um, ventilation system fan when there's a significant source of air pollution, like a fire. It seems to help a little bit, although more science needs to be done on that. And um, UV, um, UV in homes has been used for specific control of specific health outcomes like asthma and allergies. And there is some evidence in that, that that can help as long as you make sure you get a good engineering firm to do a, a good installation for you. So that's what, how I can answer Adam's question. That's great, thank you. Yeah, I, I've often wondered about sure, the future of home ventilation and will there be an opportunity for having your home in like your car, right? In recycle mode when you don't want to air condition the universe or heat the universe when the air is clean and you'd like to keep your air yours. Um, but then in other situations where you'd want to clear things out, um, we have a whole house fan in our house that we use um, because there are times of year, months of the year when it will cool off in the evening in Claremont and we'd like to pull in that cool air and not be air conditioning. Um, the house. And so that 
you know, offers also a ventilation opportunity if you can, if you can use that. So I don't know if that's something that maybe more people will be looking to in the future, but um, certainly all different ways to, as we learn more and more about the importance of of air quality. And as it becomes more common knowledge, I think we've had a leap here with, with COVID and a leap in air, aerosol fluency. Well, maybe <laughs> in some cases or, right. or misinformation in others, but certainly people are talking about that. And, and I'm wondering if there'll be more interest in all of those things. Um, I think a, so. And I, the, the high, I like that you brought up the, the whole house fan we, there are high performance building designs being, being um, advocated for, especially in the era of climate change. And the high performance home design area, I'll just mention briefly, is a, called a passive house home design. Passive means you don't actually have to do much to keep it at a comfortable temperature and relative humidity because it's so well, um, it's so well insulated and so well designed and great windows. and. There are uh, lower, it has been used to build like low income housing and, and um, dorms for universities, as well as like, you know, pretty fancy houses as well. But the passive house design, I think is the house of the future where you can ventilate at the right rate. You can filter the urban air. If you live in LA, you're gonna wanna have an ozone filter um, or Denver too, for that matter. <laughs> Um, and you can use, and so I think, anyways, I think there is movement in some areas about how can we address climate change and building design with new ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we did get a question before the webinar today that touches on that actually, which was um, if we had any thoughts on Project Drawdown, um, which I love. I love Project Drawdown. I use it in my teaching. Um, in my climate courses, because it's, it's, you know, climate solutions from every angle, and there's some uh, quantifying and ranking of, of what's effective. And you, you know, you'd be surprised uh, it, what the solutions are and how effective they are. And one of the things that, you know, surprised me and then, and then really shouldn't have was how impactful changing refrigerants are. So we talk about building design for air quality and climate but also appliance design, uh, moving away from refrigerants that are extremely potent greenhouse gases. And companies are now just starting to do this and make it transparent what they're using um, to refrigerants that have no global warming potential. And because they're so potent, even though there's not nearly as, as much of these compounds as CO2 and methane, uh, you can really have an impact on, on climate if you move away from these. So, um, so Project Drawdown, I'm not sure who asked that, but I, I love that resource. I recommend it to a lot of people who are looking for uh, teaching resources or just to learn more about um, the intersection of things they already want to do that are also good for climate because I think there's so many opportunities to, to find those intersections and do something um, that works for you, that's meaningful for you, that uh, connects with you in some way and is helpful. Yeah, that's really important. And one of the things that we did in a, in a recent project with the city of Boulder was to pilot this idea of, we want homeowners to think about electrification of their homes. And we don't just want them to do it for climate, but can we get people to think about this for other reasons like health and better indoor air quality? So we did a short pilot to see if that was even possible. And what we did find was that the indoor air quality in completely electrified homes was much better than the indoor air quality in conventional homes or even hybrid homes. And because of these results, you know, we, this is how science works. You try something, it seems to work, but then you try it again and then it doesn't. So you better keep trying to see if it's a real association. So we're gonna try to do a much bigger study to show, hey, even electrification of your house is good for indoor air quality and therefore good for your health. I think that would be that would be really helpful if if we had if that was the case and and we have good information about it because I see a lot um, in the pro climate world about electrifying homes um, for good reason right so as as energy sources either your own if you have solar panels or your local energy source becomes clean becomes solar and wind and, and therefore electric then you're not reliant on natural gas for any of your um, heating or cooking 
needs. And so I'm, yeah, I'm on the lookout always for, you know, do we, do we replace this thing that's working perfectly well? What's the, what's the better, what's the better call? Do we move our stove to electric? Do we change our water heater? Um, it's, it's tough, uh, even when you know what the, you know, what the benefits are. Yeah. I think that call. Well, as we're coming up on the hour, um, are there any last um, thoughts or um, things you would like to tell our audience about climate change, COVID, aerosols? I'll let you go first, Shelley. Sure. Well, I'll just start by saying aerosol is just, aerosols are just particles suspended in the air. It's not, you know, and the particles come in all different shapes and sizes, and they're made up of all sorts of things. And and the fact that aerosol science was, was an important um, um, discipline to help understand COVID is, is really cool. And I hope it helps, has helped to talk about aerosol in other ways and also to talk about like, how do you get from what you think you wanna do to then what you actually are doing and, and the, your education and the opportunities and the people that you help along the way and those that help and that help you. Um, and it's, it's just a really fun ride. And I wanna make sure that everyone knows like it's just okay to make the best decision you can at the time and, and, then, and then follow through and then make the next right decision. And that's, um, you know, that's always how I want to live my life is just to make sure to do the best and, and make the world a better place. Thanks, Shelly. That was all the things I would have said except nicer. So I will just <laughs> say thank you for everyone for coming and listening. And those of you that are watching after the fact, thank you for taking the time out. And I'll point out that we have a really special community uh, our, our current students, our alums, our faculty, um, our staff who help make all of this possible. And, uh, you know, we're really lucky. So if you have something you want to do, come, you know, find me. I'll help find the alums that can that point you in the right direction. We have excellent resources and um, this is all possible. So thank you. Well, thank you to both our speakers, you know, for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge and insights with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to our audience for your questions and for attending this event. We will follow up in within the next week with a recorded video. An announcement for alumni, Alumni April is in full swing. Please visit alumni.hmc.edu and click on the big Alumni April graphic for the schedule of events and registration links. All general upcoming events can be found on our online offerings page using the link included in your confirmation email or by visiting alumni.hmc.edu and clicking on online offerings. We welcome any suggestions you may have for upcoming events or if you are interested in hosting one, such as being on Mud Talks, please email us at alumni.hmc.edu. Thanks again for joining us and have a great weekend, everyone.